Yes, thank you Annelike and thank you in the audience as well for showing up today and thank you to Richard as well for so generously accepting our invitation to speak today. Um, because what we're going to do is not an original ID. Uh, it was actually originated by uh, Randy Posh, a professor at Carnegie Mellon, who, uh, upon being diagnosed with terminal cancer, actually gave his last lecture. And it was very inspirational, very hopeful. Um, and the same question that he asked himself, we also asked to Richard. If this was your last time in front of a classroom, what knowledge would you try to impart on the people present? Um, what do you want to say basically if you're giving a carte blanche to phrase it less <laughs> uh, morbidly um, and Richard is going to talk about what the point is of a professor um, because he is one himself at the law faculty he uh, teaches and researches uh, international law um, so yeah without further ado Richard may I welcome you to the stage and good luck with your last lecture <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, and thanks for the invitation to Extramuros and to Studium Generale for the for the invite. I have to confess that when I was asked to do this, um, I was kind of terrified of the prompt, and the reason is that, um, well, I thought, okay, I knew about the story, and I knew that there was this person who had kind of delivered a very inspirational last lecture, as you say, which turned out to be his last lecture. And I thought, how could I possibly do that? Me, uh, you know, a young assistant professor in their early 30s, how could I possibly think about my last lecture, which I hope will be very far into the distance. Um, but I was doubly concerned, firstly, because I, um, could I really imagine myself into that position, sort of hopefully 40 years from now, with something to say about uh, some last words. And then something more disturbing, which is, what if I actually find out what I want to say now, and then I've got nothing left to say for 40 years? So, so there's a whole sort of re loads of anxieties, which I did manage to push through. Um, and then I kind of landed on this topic, which I, I guess I kind of reasonably know something about, um, which is hopefully not going to bore everyone to death, which is this question of what is the point of a professor? So firstly, don't imagine that I'm actually going to give you the answer. Um, professors sometimes give answers, but not on this occasion. I really do want to find out for myself um, and potentially for others, um, other future professors, maybe also 40 years from now, and so it's partly uh, a, a time capsule for me to look back and think, oh, look what I thought the point of a professor was way back. And also just partly uh, therapy, to be honest. So trying to describe what it is that I try to do in the classroom and, and make sense of this for students, perhaps for some colleagues. So um, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes and with a bit of interaction from you and, and then I want to open into some wider discussion, questions and so on. So let's begin. So to start asking what is the point of anything is kind of asking for trouble, to be honest. Um, and this is kind of a quote that I got from this book, which is really great by Stefan Collini. It's a bit old at this point, but it's a really good book. Um, in fact, a colleague who's here today, who I'm not going to, to name, said that when um, they heard of the topic, they thought, oh, is he leaving? And I thought, okay, no, I'm not leaving, it's fine. But the question itself, it does um, presuppose that there may in fact be no point whatsoever. What's the point of a professor? Well, we don't need a professor, thank you very much. That could be an answer. But actually, if you ask anyone, not just students, of course, there's a bit of a bias if you ask colleagues, because they're professors, but if you ask family members, friends, and so on, they'll always have something to say about this, to answer to this question. My mother, who did not go to university, who is a part-time bookkeeper for some small businesses in rural Northern Ireland, and also a part-time grandmother said that she imagines a professor as someone who teaches things way beyond anything students would have known otherwise. 
In fact, there seems to be lots of possible purposes to being a professor. And now I would like, in the spirit of the interactive classroom, to kind of gain some sense of what you think the point of a professor is before I go any further. So please, just shout out some ideas from the audience. We'll take a couple. Okay, teach specialized knowledge, okay, yeah. Leading a research group, okay, yeah, yeah. Say that again, Jim. Engagement, okay, yeah, anything else? Asking critical questions, yeah, good, yes? Thinking in an analytical way, great, good, yes. So. These are kind of getting to some of the things, themes that I'm going to pick up on in a moment. Um, but when I started asking around, and actually when I started doing some research online, I encountered a whole host of possible questions. Um, a moral guide, so these are might maybe be some answers already. An inspiration, a role model to students, a purveyor of wisdom. Okay, so those are getting there. And then there were some negative responses, which kind of made me feel not so great. An exam grader, oh, that's very tragic. That's all that I am, I just ex I grade exams. A supreme authority or a dictator of some kind, so probably you may have thought that this maybe is someone, uh, a teacher that you've had in the past. A destroyer of youthful curiosity. So okay, these are really quite sad. Um, none of these, by the way, are things that uh, any student has ever written on any of my evaluations, so it's fine. And then after gathering these answers, um, like any good professor in 2023, I put my question through ChatGPT um, to make it AI-proof to see what it would say. So here's the answer it gave me. The point of a professor is to educate and inspire students in a specific field of study, conduct research to advance knowledge in their discipline, contribute to the academic community through publications and presentations, and provide mentorship and guidance to students pursuing their academic and professional goals. Okay, it's not bad, right? But of course I can't use that, um, because if I do I have to refer myself to the examination board, right? And also that really can't be the answer yet, because there's a whole R left, so I have to be able to say something else. So what I would like to do is to use the rest of the lecture to identify and unpack the more common images um, of the professor today before positing or suggesting my own image in contrast. And so to briefly summarize the, the lecture or the argument at this stage, in place of the familiar ideas about the professor as a kind of knowledge provider or a trainer for the real world, which are two very common ideas of the, of the professor today, I would like to suggest that we imagine the professor as a kind of discomforter. It's a bit of a clunky term, but I'll, I'll say more about it later. Okay, so then some caveats. So lawyers love a good caveat. So these are largely personal observations that I've had from teaching some of you, uh, but also in other places in the US and the UK. They relate primarily to law teaching, but they might be of use when thinking about the wider social sciences or humanities teaching as well. The idea of discomfort that I'm going to talk about towards the end, um, it may not be possible to do that all the time. So there's a bit of a proviso about this. There are many constraints on us as professors. Um, we, of course, need to be sure of who we're teaching, uh, what the program is, and there's many other things besides. So take this idea of discomfort as a way to strategically intervene, let's say, in the classroom. Sometimes it may not make sense to intervene in this way. Um, and then lastly, as ChatGPT already informed you, um, teachers don't just teach. So however much you students might think we do, we also do many other things. So we conduct research, we attend and organize conferences, we form reading groups, we publish articles, books, blog posts, edit, 
commit, uh, edit journals, comment on each other's work, supervise theses, sit on university committees, attend meetings. We catch up with one another over, over lunch or coffee. We also shockingly have lives outside of the university. So I enjoy creative writing, playing the cello, and I'm currently obsessed with the HBO series Succession. Indeed, this is also partly why I struggled to uh, think about the topic of the last lecture. Not because I was watching uh, too much TV, but because I kind of started to think, maybe I should be suggesting that you all do something way outside of what this university is about. Call an elderly relative, read a good book, laugh, uh, help out a friend, and so on. There's a whole world outside the classroom uh, for both students and teachers, and I think it's important not to lose sight of that. But that doesn't mean that there's no point to being a professor, but that being a professor, being in a classroom, isn't the only point. At the same time, there's a whole world inside the classroom, and what professors do there can be deeply impactful, not only in terms of what we teach, but how. And I don't just mean uh, which interactive learning tools we use or how we assess students. I mean how we model intellectual and social engagement and what world we as professors create for students inside the classroom. And from speaking to some colleagues and listening to conversations, I think a lot of the time those kind of crucial elements of the classroom are kind of partly ignored um, or maybe even just reproduced without much thought. So for the teachers in the audience, this might uh, help us to think more intentionally about things that we take for granted uh, or don't realize that we're doing. So I now begin then to sketch the common images of the professor. So the first one being this idea of a professor as, as a knowledge provider. Everyone with me so far? Yeah? Okay. So this is not a recent idea. Uh, it stretches far back into uh, ideas about the function even of the, of the medieval university long before the Enlightenment uh, came along and changed everything. Uh, Elizabeth de Burg, founder of Clare College, Cambridge, said in 1359 that through their study and teaching at the university, scholars should discover and acquire a precious pearl of learning so that it does not stay hidden under a bushel but is displayed abroad to enlighten those who walk in the dark paths of ignorance. So I probably should have had some kind of pearl here as a visual. The precious pearl of learning then, it continues to feature heavily in the modern professor's teaching toolkit, even though it's many centuries later, except we don't quite use that term. Today, we would call it perhaps knowledge transfer. The pearl has morphed into lectures or knowledge clips, where a teacher provides basic points or concepts before the student begins their readings. But the idea is similar to the pearl, right? So that the professor who's an expert in their own field transfers knowledge to the students uh, uh, through what they've learned themselves. And that knowledge, which was called wisdom in the time of Elizabeth de Burgh, comprises not only facts, but a sense of how the field works, its expectations, its cultural routines. Especially in law, knowledge transfer doesn't just mean getting students to understand a court decision, right? But it might also be about understanding how a judge arrived at that decision. So knowledge of interpretation, let's say. Or in thinking about whether that decision was correct. So knowledge about appropriate normative outcomes. So we could visualize this image of the professor as kind of a conveyor belt in some way, or a vehicle by which knowledge is sort of implanted into all of you. And there's something very appealing about this image, actually. It sets clear expectations about the role of the professor and the role of the student. It separates knowledge from application in ways that help students to develop theoretical skills, critical judgment, some of the things that you mentioned. 
And indeed, it would be kind of a very poor professor today who did not engage in any knowledge transfer. So someone who just sort of jumps in during week one and says, what do you think, without having given any kind of context. That would be kind of like throwing students into a lifeboat without an oar, right? But this image of the professor as a vehicle or a conveyor belt has its problems. So the first is, what idea of knowledge is implied by this image of, of knowledge transfer? So knowledge is a pearl. This is, that's what Elizabeth de Berg said, or an item on the conveyor belt, something prepackaged and ready for consumption by you students. That kind of sets the wrong tone, right? Knowledge is not really a commodity. It's not a brand of detergent that you can value and compare against competing products, right? That's not what knowledge is. On a deeper level, such an idea of knowledge also assumes that it can be packaged and kind of transmitted in isolation from its wider context and from the context in which students encounter it. So in law, students are trained to think of law as something that can and should be isolated from its context uh, so that its rules and principles can be applied to a whole range of different scenarios. And that's the basis for the problem-based uh, exam question, which many of you had to do, were endured for uh, one of my classes. That's a kind of hypothetical scenario where you kind of apply your legal knowledge to advise uh, a client in some way. But the context is crucial, right? The context of knowledge is, is generally regarded as sort of inseparable, one would say. So for example, the history of slavery is rather important for the history of international law, which is my field. The slave trade was abolished in the UK in the early 19th century. And this on its own, as a fact, is okay, that's interesting. But there's a lot of context around it if this is the only thing that you uh, listen to or the only thing that you find out. Do we also know that uh, the same law that abolished the slave trade also compensated slave owners for the loss of earnings? Or that slavery itself remained legal? Or that the reason for the abolition wasn't necessarily humanitarian, but was more about the fact that the slave trade was becoming pretty economically bad business. So talking about the prohibition of the slave trade, interesting enough on its own, but we forget then all these other things around it, the wider context of slavery, the economy of empire, and this leads us to have a pretty basic understanding of that particular question. The other issue with this idea of knowledge is that even the setting in which students encounter facts shapes how facts are understood. So talking to a group of 30 or so liberal arts students about EU law in a Dutch university is very different to talking about EU law to 30 residents of the asylum center in Terrapel, for example. In the safety of the university, students may feel empowered to say things that they would not otherwise in another setting. You might forget the personal impact of a legal regime, or you might feel more empowered to imagine other possibilities beyond the status quo. This is because the classroom is not cut off from the real world, contrary to what some might think. It is a socially situated space. It's a microcosm of wider society and social relations, local, national, global. And the value and meaning of these facts in the classroom will change over the years as society changes. So pretending that we can keep knowledge sort of separated off from the context and from where and when we approach it, I think would kind of be to deny that we exist in the world. The last issue with this knowledge transfer image is that it establishes quite a hierarchical classroom. So I'm the expert, you the students are knowledge deficient, 
and the knowledge flows from me to you, right? But students are in the world. By age 19, 20, you've maybe had experiences that I have never had, may never have. And although a classroom isn't necessarily a therapy session, those experiences have created other forms of knowledge that are deeply instructive for students and indeed for teachers. So I recall in one of my administrative law classes uh, when I began at Tilburg, where we had spent many weeks talking about certain principles of administrative law. So important principles like transparency, participation, the right to review and appeal a decision and so on. Only for one student towards the end of the course to intervene and tell us at length about her very racialized experience of the German immigration system, which I think told most people, if they hadn't experienced it themselves, that these principles on their own really might not be enough to overcome what she was clearly experiencing as deeper patterns of structural racism. So the knowledge transfer or the conveyor belt model ignores those active students, I think, and those stories. And it pretends that everyone except the professor is passive. And in that respect, the image kind of uncritically adopts the social relations of other spaces. Obeying the professor, uh, obeying the authority of the professor quickly translates into obeying the authority of the employer. And then that turns into quickly obeying the authority of a political leader. And professors, I think, should be kind of reluctant to normalize those social hierarchies. Okay, so the knowledge provider model then seems to be useful to a degree, but may also have damaging implications for students. Now, this model has been around for a very long time. It's still a popular idea. There are those who though, increasingly interact or react against that model, partly because of the limitations I already identified. And they have tried to update that model with their own. So I call this the idea of the professor as a trainer for the real world. So where the knowledge conveyor belt only conveys information, the trainer is kind of helping students to apply knowledge or imply information to the real world. The conveyor belt centers the professor and their expertise, but the trainer model looks to all the information that might help to resolve certain real world problems or challenges, where the conveyor belt helps create a hierarchy between professor and student. The trainer model turns the professor into more of a facilitator of students who are the real active participants in class-based exercises or simulations. And all of these, I think, are good updates to the previous model. And there are some additional aspects of the trainer model which are seen as improvements, right? So that instead of just giving students the basic building blocks of knowledge and a bit of application, the classroom should be about skills training, right? So law students should not only know how to read and interpret a case, but they should have writing skills, research skills, negotiation skills, time management skills, and so on. So that's partly a different vocabulary to describe the pearl of wisdom that I was describing earlier, but it also has a more specific meaning. Whereas the knowledge being transferred might have been used for many purposes, so think back to the medieval university, okay, this stuff could have been used for work, but it may also have been used for self-improvement or for the simple joy of learning and so on. Now in this trainer model, the skills are much more focused on the professional world, right? Students are expected to enter this world after they graduate. And so skills training, the idea goes, prepares students for the world of work or for the real world, right? Another key dimension of this skills trainer model of being a professor concerns what students will be doing with these skills. Here again, 
Skills designed for professional application are not just learned for fun. They have a specific purpose, which is to help organizations, i.e. your future employers, to, and society writ large to solve problems. How many of you have heard in classes, professors tell you about problem solving or tackling great challenges, or even now the sort of wicked problems is also a very common terminology, right? So this is everywhere. Problem solving is the mode of professional intervention par excellence, and skills training equips students with the tools to help resolve or manage those problems. And the image we have then of the professor is kind of as a firefighter, or at least someone who trains firefighters. Um, and that's particularly, I think, applicable in something like international law, where you have areas like environmental law or global health law that are set up, or at least seem to be set up, to put out fires like infectious diseases or climate change and so on. Now, this image of the kind of the firefighter or the professor as a trainer is much more grounded than the knowledge transfer idea, the conveyor belt, because it responds to the realities facing society. And it kind of seeks to adapt learning and teaching to match what organizations and society needs. But let's just scratch a little deeper. One consequence of gearing learning to what are perceived as practical problems is that a strange hierarchy again gets put in place. We're familiar with this division between theory and practice, right? One is to do with the conceptualization of a field or to simplify complexity in some way. And the other is about applying tools to a situation. So very, in very basic terms, one is about thinking, the other one is about doing, right? But when teaching is about practical problem solving, theory kind of falls away a little. Practice is kind of believed to be free of the burdens of theory, which are kind of regarded as sort of unhelpful jargon. And here, theory kind of gets subordinated to practice. And the practicality of courses increases, and at least in my experience, this also means that about theory. But if practice is about solutions, then theory is kind of about defining problems. Or that's one way that you could think about theory. And what use are a set of practical tools if we don't know what the problem is? Implicit within this problem-solving mindset is the idea that we all kind of already know what the problem is, and the only task that is left is to figure out how best to apply our tools to resolve it. Personally, I wonder whether we have maybe enough problem solvers out there, and if we don't maybe need more problem framers, more theoreticians, to help us understand the problem better. Another implication of this skills training image of the professor comes from how it imagines the real world. So if we are to help students tackle global problems, then we're essentially preparing uh, students to become professionals in various types of organizations, companies, governments, research institutes, universities, of course. And you might have heard of the school to prison pipeline, which is often a way of describing the way that some minority communities easily end up in prison. Well, this is the school to employer pipeline, right? Where students are kind of largely funneled into thinking of themselves as a kind of future employee. And my question here is whether this is the only real world we should be envisaging for our students or preparing you for. Framed this way, society seems a pretty lonely, bleak place. Isolated employers, as kind of centers of your entire life. What does the professor here have to offer to students as future members of a local community or a residence association, or as a citizen, as an activist, as a protester, as someone who is not sure what's wrong with the world? Not much if you're only concerned with problem solving. 
again here, the professor as a trainer image concedes, I think, too much to those institutions, government and companies and so on, that we're trying to get students to have a view about or to critique possibly. So simply preparing you to uncritically optimize those institutions without getting you to think about the damage that those institutions are causing is, I think, professionally irresponsible. So training students for the real world takes too much for granted. Society's inbuilt inequalities and hierarchies and attempts to train you into a system rather than getting you to question that system. And the growing similarities even between universities and companies is particularly disturbing at a time when the hierarchies that get maintained by the modern economy are resulting in untold levels of inequality and misery and destruction of the planet. I want students to be ready for the real world, but maybe not as a corporate lawyer, maybe as a pro bono advisor to Tilburg students who need decent affordable housing or in raising awareness about the conditions in the refugee camp in Terrapel, or in other contexts like international law, about perhaps asking whether that field is enough to stop global inequality. At the same time, one cannot, as a teacher, just shout revolution in every class. Uh, students need a training. That's why you came here, and in this uh, particular environment, it's training in a professional culture, at least uh, law uh, is. This doesn't necessarily mean institutionalizing you into law, or even getting you to believe that law is a good thing. It's just having a sense, as a student, of your own responsibility as a legally trained member of society, and then appreciating the wide range of tools that are at your disposal when you go out into the world. So how does the professor then encourage this way of thinking or this space between theory and practice or between hierarchy and revolution? Okay, so this is where this idea of the discomforter comes in. So to talk about discomfort, can cause a bit of confusion or, or discomfort. Um, people tend to automatically think that it means we need to make our students feel uncomfortable in some way. Maybe long, awkward silences while we wait for students to respond to our questions in class or something. But being uncomfortable is not the same thing as being made to feel discomfort. In fact, I think the ideal classroom for a professor is one in which students feel entirely at ease to speak their minds, to be inarticulate, to fumble through their thoughts without judgment, without repercussions, because after all, how else are we supposed to learn? And it's also important to recall that if the university classroom is a microcosm of society, then it also harbors many of the same dynamics that society does gender dynamics, racial dynamics, meaning that as a professor, you can't be tone deaf when talking about sensitive issues in international law, like slavery or like violence against women. When half of my students are women in their early 30s or early 20s, sorry, and a sizable number are uh, ethnic minorities, it would be irresponsible of me not to acknowledge the basic fact that there are much, they're much more likely to have experienced these academic questions personally than I have, and then to not somehow build that into how I approach them in the classroom. So discomfort here is not necessarily about pandering to a particular type of student, but in getting students to into a productive collective discomfort so that we can explore these ideas together. So, if discomfort is not being uncomfortable, then what is it? It is a space to inhabit where everyone, everything is questioned. It is staying with a legal problem rather than trying to come up with an easy 
solution or a quick fix. And it is also admitting one's own role in reproducing social hierarchy, whether as a teacher or as a student. So in short, discomfort relates to our own preconceived ideas about the world and about what we're learning. We all have ideas about the world and what we read, but often it's precisely those ideas that get in the way of critical thought or from approaching the world in a completely new way. So for example, scholars and practitioners are very quick to talk about the benefits of human rights to the world, but they're quite reluctant to talk about how human rights has monopolized many discussions on inequality and injustice. At a very basic level, the expansion of human rights has coincided not with a decrease in global inequality, but in a widening gap between the very rich and the very poor. Thinking about the role that human rights is playing here kind of is discomforting to us. We kind of want to believe that we're doing good by advocating more and more effective human rights. Or we automatically rush to international law as the answer to, say, the Russo-Ukraine war. Putin is a war criminal. The UN Charter has been violated. Yes, most of us would agree to that. But what role has international law played in increasing the tension, right? In setting up self-defense as a key exception to the prohibition on the use of force that Putin has been able to exploit, or in allowing Russian soldiers to lawfully kill Ukrainian civilians where this is deemed a proportionate and in furtherance of Russia's military objectives. It is discomforting to us to find that what we thought was the solution might actually be part of the problem. Our assumptions get challenged and our faith in the discipline is shaken. One might begin to even go through the various stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining. One might start to ask, what is the point of being a professor? And it's often much easier to continue holding the views that you've had because they're familiar, they're simple, or because they kind of don't require you to make difficult choices, or they don't require you to have difficult conversations with your friends, your family, yourself. But would that really be learning? Unfortunately, conceiving of the professor as a trainer for the real world, I think completely cuts off this possibility for discomfort. It can be difficult in the moment to know how to apply your expertise in a specific scenario, right? But that's not very discomforting. So in fact, if you work through the problem, you get an answer, you kind of feel very comfortable, very proud that you've kind of got it right. You feel you've embodied what it means to be a successful lawyer and that you then think, well, I could fit into a law firm or a government department. But none of that requires us to question assumptions about society or about the lawyer's role in it. So at this point, if you're a professor, you probably are also thinking, okay, how can I get students to question everything or challenge every assumption? They have to understand something first. And besides, they also have to get assessed at the end of all of this. And yes, it's true. We as professors do need to get our good evaluations. Um, but it's also true that it's easier to keep students slightly comfortable in beliefs or to not question many things. But I'm not entirely sure that that's why teachers go into this profession in the first place. I don't think that that's probably what people would respond if you asked them, what is a professor today? So done well, discomfort can be more rewarding for teachers, for students in the long term. It can be a kind of model for how you go about your daily life way beyond this sort of student evaluations that we've come to be concerned about. But discomfort is key, I think. And so in closing, I'm going to pose some examples of what I think discomfort looks like from the professor's side. Okay. So in a problem question or hypothetical requiring you to argue in favor of the position that you're opposed to, 
So if you're normally the kind of person who might, say, argue for the human rights organization, then maybe you would be required to argue in favor of the company to see what this does to your legal reasoning. Resisting the urge to answer questions about the correct answer or interpretation of a text. Okay, something might be legally justifiable or more legally justifiable. It doesn't mean that it's the correct interpretation. Many of you have already read much social theory, so I don't think I need to tell you what about correct interpretations. Resisting the request that the professor tells students what their opinion is on a legal question. I have a sneaking feeling that when I get asked this question, it's because the student wants to say what I think in the exam or do the opposite. Rebut me so that they can say, oh, look, I can take the completely opposite position. So I kind of resist giving my own personal position on something like this. Spending a little longer on the student who has a very strong position to kind of soften that certainty and to make them question it a little longer. Getting students to flip between different arguments, making them proficient in doing so. Offering a blank text with no mention of the author, date, source, anything like this to kind of force an analysis without any context. Taking an unserious text, so for example, I chose here a tweet by the former US president, uh, extremely seriously as a text, kind of analyzing it as if it is a really serious text. Or the opposite, which is taking a very serious text, like a court judgment, not seriously at all. Banning laptops, which we can talk about. Contextualizing or decontextualizing the conversation. Contrasting different texts and drawing out their contradictions. And also then asking whether there might be a point where our expertise runs out. Or a point where the language, especially the language of law, might need to be set aside for something else, politics say. So these are only some ideas that I've had and I've picked up and tried out in classes. And honestly, they kind of work. Um, they seem to keep students interested without sort of simply force feeding them facts um, and without also turning them into future professionals. So in short, they get students to think for themselves, which I think is kind of the basis of what I've been trying to tell you in the most open, critical, radical way possible. That is, I think, what a university could still be for. It's certainly what I've come to think a professor, this professor, is for. So I'm going to end here. Uh, thanks for listening, and let's discuss. Um, yeah, for the discussion, uh, please speak into the microphone um, so that we also have it on the recording. Who wants to start? Uh, you, you mentioned banning laptops. Yeah. Uh, why? So, um, yeah, that was good. So I, uh, I did this for a class that I had uh, this semester, and no one complained, firstly, which I was quite surprised about. And, and by the end, they were all very glad that I had done so. And I think, well, partly it comes for me, the discomfort thing comes up again, which is it's very comforting, deeply comforting, I think, on a, on a now a human, but also a non-human level at this point to have a screen that you can then hide in, right? So, oh, I don't quite know the answer. And I'm now going to look at this screen. And so I don't have to look at the professor's eyes. I'm not here. Of course, students don't realize that I'm still here and I can still call on them. But, you know, there's something about not having this wall. It is a wall uh, in some ways. And, and it kind of forces them either to be looking at something else, their notes, or to be looking up. So in substitute for the laptop in this course, I just printed off um, a reader for the course, which was like lots of texts, the, the text that we were reading for the whole course. And I think that kind of helped take the edge off the laptop ban. So there was something that they had 
that they, they could kind of rely on, which is good. But I think there's a kind of comfort now in being able to kind of retreat slightly behind behind it. It doesn't mean that in other courses I haven't used technology a lot, as as you know. So yeah, that's kind of the reason. Um, to what extent do you think the structure of the university, you know, with recent developments over the past 20 years, um, bigger classrooms, more students, less time, more pressure, to what extent do you think the structures of the university are uh, prohibiting or, or making it more difficult for you to be a, a disruptor or a, a discomforter as a professor? Yeah, I mean, I would say probably a lot, really. I mean, I didn't say much about the evaluations, but um, there is, I think, a, something that you can take from the, the shift to the student-centered experience, right? So on the face of it, the student-centered experience, who doesn't like that? Obviously, that, that's what everyone wants, right? But it's very similar to the customer-oriented experience. And I think there's something partly troubling in that shift because it's not the same relationship. You're not buying a product from me. Uh, you're not, you know, going to give me a five-star rating on Uber Eats or something afterwards. And so my concern there is that there's something in the nature of the student-teacher relationship that gets lost when it turns into the student is now also assessing how good or how much the professor is kind of meeting their expectations. I thought it was the other way around. I thought it was sort of the professor, or at least the class as a whole, that was supposed to be collectively challenging what they thought their expectations were. So this is where I start to then hope that uh, this move to you know bigger classes or also you know really putting a lot of weight on things like student evaluations doesn't then just turn into an opportunity to get every classroom to look the same or to get teachers to conform to a particular model i mean discomforting types of teaching or disruptive types of teaching might actually be kind of messy and kind of chaotic in some way and it might lead some students to say in the evaluation this was a, a messy course right I, I don't like this course so there's a kind of clear correlation there where the clarity of what you're able to convey I think might then result in kind of conformity among among teachers and I mean obviously on a just on a basic level having class sizes of 200 let's say versus 30 is is obviously makes it much more difficult to discuss these things but there is also the benefit of of technology here too i'm not a luddite so i mean i i kind of think that in those situations you can really use technology very very use well so you have polls going with students and so on it actually kind of gets people to say something who may not otherwise have said something because everyone has voted so they have some kind of reason for voting right whereas maybe if they were one in a class of 200 before, they might just have sat and said nothing. So there are some disadvantages, pretty big disadvantages to that kind of shift. Um, but I think it's important to kind of be aware of them and then try to either counteract them or make the most of them through the tools that we have. Thank you. Yeah, so... When I heard your prompt, I got really excited because a few months earlier, I was asking myself the same question <laughs> as to what the point of me going to university is. And then when you heard the lecture, you were no longer excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what I was thinking, um, so when we have all these different resources, like we have access to all the journals that Etobo University Library gives us access to, um, it's, it feels like a professor is just another source among a sea of a bunch of other sources. And I mean, when we can mix and match all these different sources to reach like the most informed opinion that we can. And it seems like a professor is just one other source that may be faulty or even non-credible. 
So I'm thinking maybe the answer to the point for Professor Lin is closer towards the two latter images of a trainer and a discomforter. Uh -huh. But at the same time, um, I see. I think the answer is more nuanced. I think it's just a combination of a bunch of different things. It might be just a combination of like all the images. But a thing in the a thing I heard about law majors. I mean, I'm studying law, um, kind of. <laughs> but a thing I heard is that professors are supposed to kind of brand or impart legal thinking onto their students. But to this day, I'm still not sure what legal thinking is. <laughs> but yeah, that'd be about it. I'm not sure if these are coherent, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess the first thing would be um, whoever said professors are supposed to be X, um, mm -hmm. bad start, right? I don't know who they were. Right? I'm not going to, but but I'm sure that there are as many ideas of what a the point of a professor is as there are professors, right? So that's kind of why I was giving those caveats at the start. Um, but it is true, I think, that there are occasions where, uh, like I was sort of saying earlier as well, doing the discomforting, doing the disrupting may be completely inappropriate as the best way to teach. So. And here's the actually the example, liberal arts. So all of the liberal arts students that I teach, by the time they reach me, have been reading Nietzsche and have been reading all sorts of fantastic philosophical and social theory texts. And for me then, as the law person or the international European law person, I then run, in, run into the problem, which is, what do I do here? Do I continue with those same things? By that stage, you've kind of gotten a lot of it, right? Or do I then kind of completely go the opposite direction, which is to uh, only give you kind of the facts or the, what, exactly what you need for passing the exam? And I kind of ended up sort of slightly in the middle, which is the trainer model, right? And there are, there are problems to it, and I guess you know, this is a, a confession in a way, right? So I end up doing this because I think, well, these are other types of skills that I think would be super useful. And I also know that many people who end up doing the liberal arts um, program are different to, say, a regular law student. You are often, like, honestly, more politically active, just as a very basic point. And so... My thinking here is I don't want to stifle that political consciousness, but I would like to then be able to give another set of very powerful tools, legal tools. I mean, it's good or bad that they're powerful, but they are. So that when you end up in the world, you can then use those tools in a strategic way for political projects in which you might be interested. Right, so that is kind of where you might have to combine them all. Yeah, totally. I mean, the I think they're all ideal types in a way. None of them are completely sealed off from the other. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so there's just two notes that I would like to add. Um, one is that I think that question that was just posed is is actually the most important one. Um, I think every, every student and also every teacher should ask themselves at this moment, what is the point? And that's also the reason I uh, showed up today. Um, one answer for myself that I, that I have that I, um, after teaching and after going to university myself, is that there's one thing that you can get out of university that I think is very important and it is unique. And that is that university offers a space, mainly in the classrooms, where you get to discuss openly with people more or less in your age group that are might be very different. And if you think about it, and this is something I only realized once I was done studying, that there are not that many places in, the, in your life after university that offer that. And it might not feel as much, right? So it might just be, okay, what's the point of having an open 
discussion with people. But I do think it is something that can give you a lot in your life, maybe just for your own personal development uh, that can shape you. And that is something that university offers. Maybe it just only offers it because it has that platform, right? I don't know if, um, if there could not be a better institution to offer that. But let's say students show up to university and that's maybe the best thing that it has. Now, a second point, one that I use as kind of a personal ethic when teaching is I actually like, um, there's this um, essay by Max Weber. It's called Teaching as a Vocation. Uh, and it's a bit of a classical piece. I think it would fit more in the, in the category of uh, knowledge uh, uh, giver, right? Uh, but what Max Weber essentially says is that the most um, important thing as a teacher is to limit yourself to, te to teaching, to not become, to not use the power, because there's a certain power when you stand in front of a classroom that's just due to, uh, there's a certain charisma to just having that floor. To not use that to impose your political opinion. And when I read this, I thought this was a, this was kind of a shocking thing to read. Like, okay, so sh you should be careful not to use the power you have to impose your view of the world. And that's a guideline I, I try to keep a bit. So what does that mean? What does teaching become then? So for me, I think it is quite a modest role. So I think the first is you offer, you're sort of offer that space to have students interact with each other, to have that moment. And the second, what I try to do is to make every individual a little bit more dangerous. So I want them to have certain tools for whatever purpose they want to use them, good or bad, to be a bit more effective in those tools. And I think that should be the modest goal of a teacher. And professor, I don't know, because I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we're using the distinction, but I just yeah. talk about teaching in, in general. So, thank you. Thank you, yeah, I, I think that's great, I agree. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one final question. Thank you. It was very interesting. Um, now, I just wanted to say that uh, I had a gap year, so I really uh, I felt what it was like to not go to university for a while. So it was like, for me, being able to go to Stream Generale is very nice. And um, I'm also trying to stimulate, stimulate myself and wanting to learn um, because I really noticed that I really miss going to university because you can actually learn a lot. And I was therefore wondering, what can you do to be a discomforter for yourself and to learn outside uh, of the classroom? Like I have a couple of months till I start my master and I really notice I miss, you know, the discussions and the learning environment. And I was wondering, how can you create that space outside of the classroom? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's pretty difficult. So as, as Brandt was saying, I mean, yeah. the classroom is almost sort of designed specifically for that purpose. I mean, you could just say that, okay, it's an open space and, and you can have a kind of collective conversation. But in that space, you're almost allowed, like I, I'm allowed to, to be discomforting in some way. Whereas, you know, if, if I was a, a boss and I had employees, that, that wouldn't really be make much sense. Like I have, I have employees, they have tasks to, to complete. There's no point in discomforting them. Right. But the whole idea of you being here in some way is, is to try and uh, further that side of things when it comes to, I mean, doing this outside of the classroom, surely that's a kind of daily constant thing. Right. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what I would say here. I think, uh, Again, this might be overstepping the bounds of the professor because uh, this is my domain is the classroom, I guess. But yeah, you have to also be in the world, right? And probably there are lots of spaces that you're in where you find yourself maybe, okay, having certain assumptions, not challenging assumptions that others have, um, perhaps kind of allowing things to go unsaid because you're kind of afraid of the consequences and so on, or you're maybe not sure exactly why you think something, but you would like to explore. I mean, those things are important to explore and they can be kind of difficult because we're used to being in the same old structures, right? And things are kind of settled for us and they're simple and it's easy to make sense of something. But those things are precisely what we should be trying to 
push against, right? So it might happen in anything. It, it could happen just in reading. It, it might happen in conversations with friends or other people. Um, but it might also happen if you are kind of active in volunteering or in many other areas of life, right? So I think it's an open sphere. It's not just that you go and discomfort, oh, uh, for 15 minutes a week in that particular place, right? So I think you could and you should try to then make this part of your own way of being in the world. Yeah, thank you for sharing even outside of uh, being a professor. That was interesting. Thank you. Yes, and on this note, let's conclude this last lecture. Well done, Richard. You survived. Right. <laughs> um, hopefully many more lectures to come. It was very engaging. Thank you all for showing up, for engaging in a very lively discussion. Uh, speaking of the discussion, um, we have drinks outside. So if you would like to continue it, just go down the hallway, have a drink, and um, discuss some more about what the point is of a professor. Uh, but before we do that, once again, please give a big round of applause to Richard. Thank you.